of research on what actually makes real cross-functional teams work in an industrial environment. Uh, and so, I've been doing this stuff for a long time, and I've also been in the A teaching for about 15 years. And uh, Janet and I have been partnered in the co Creativity Institute before that, the Appleseed Associates. We've done value engineering work, organizational development work. Actually, all we always do teamwork, cross-functional teamwork. It's just sometimes we, we help somebody redesign a building, sometimes we help them change the organization. Uh, we've spent about time the same shtick works on lots and lots of different stuff. So that's not what we're at. So one of the things I've been playing with is, um, one of the things hit me a long time ago was the idea that I really enjoy running something. And it's really awesome for making long lists of short ideas. But in the real world, there's a whole lot of problems that need short lists of long ideas. So that the actual technique is not as useful as you think, although it's a great way to get people in the habit of flexibility and fluency, and then you try to keep them moving on in the slower forms of, you know, how do you lay that whole manufacturing plant? Maybe I want four layouts for a manufacturing plant. I don't want to say, you know, it's like Janet always says, Einstein did not brainstorm E equals MC squared, you know, F sub squared, what about, you know, it's like, you know, it's that way. So what I'm looking at here is an idea that basically, I first want to get some more information about you guys, I had a quick name thing, but I just asked, want to get from you guys, um, kind of what your affiliation organization is, what's the favorite thing you innovate or lead innovation on? And what's your favorite trick or technique? Creativity and genius are two different things. It's not enough to be smart, but it ain't enough to be creative. Okay, kind of that whole thing. We've all had that experience. So, basically, the big thing for me is I've long been convinced that there are different types of ideas and innovations. And then if you're using a particular process, there's a whole bunch of ideas you're never going to get. Because you're not going that direction. Okay, so my favorite technique has always been function analysis. What's the function? Um, what the, here's number time. We just did a whole contract teaching it for marketing people to how to understand technology and map with function analysis as part of their whole product development process. And the thing is, you get different answers depending on tools you use. And so, so I've often wondered if our choice of facilitation tools affects the type of success we get. And especially someone who's only one or two techniques, they pretty are limited, they're really limited to what they can actually get. And I, I've watched people try to use trees on computer programs. You're an idiot. Okay. Maybe you've had success with your Well, no, but I know, but I know why they're it, 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 it's, there's it's, a there's a such a specific place to use it, otherwise it's Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And it's like, you know, you apply the tool, like when they put quality programs into General Motors, my sister worked there and she talked about the fact that the only metric that training people could find for training quality was how well you laid the flimsy on the overhead. <laughs> that was the only measurement, but they had to have a measurement, so that became it. It's like, what? <laughs> what are you doing? Okay. Um, so it's kind of a modeling process. Now, you've talked, like, for example, your example is going in there, get used to your creativity and your knowledge to come up with ideas. That's definitely innovation. There's a lot of innovations that were just pure dumb luck. Or smart people, you got the right person at the right time, got the idea, got it done. Okay. But what we're really talking about in facilitation is deliberate creativity, deliberate innovation. When you're choosing to invest resources to get innovation. I'm not talking about Newton sitting under a tree and an apple falls on his head, okay? That stuff happens all the time. But as a society, we can't wait for enough apples to fall on the right head to get all the stuff we need. <laughs> so you need to have ways that are most likely to be useful. So I ended up with a model that I'm playing with right now that's six cells in two dimensions. And I'll show, I'll go through the details, just kind of give you a preview. There's a type of target. This is the old adaptive innovator of curtains model, which happens to be identical to the strategy work between uh, cost leadership and uh, feature leadership. And I'm going to talk about types of creativity and innovation work between innovation, between inspiration, articulation, and implementation. So let me talk a little bit about this. John O'Leary came out with a book uh, recently called I'm, called Imagine. Got a huge amount of trouble because he was too creative. He made up a number of quotes <clears throat> in the book and was caught for it. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's like he attributed <laughs> thing. He, he forgot to attribute to himself. So he was making up, in the spirit of the book, he made up quotes to support his argument. 
But nevertheless, there's some very interesting ideas in here. And one of them I thought was crazy is he starts out discussing drug use. Like, what? And the thing out with is poets really like amphetamines. They like speed. They just do that, okay? And what it is, it turns out that amphetamines don't give you energy, they give you focus. That, and this is the reason why amphetamines are used for ADD people. You give them Ritalin, they get focus long. Okay? So poets are doing work because to write a poem, you have to stay there and keep writing and editing and writing and editing and writing and editing. Okay? And Einstein had a great quote that said that physicists are machines that turn coffee into equations. You know, you drink enough coffee, you just keep focused, you just keep working, and he just would walk around drinking a lot of coffee trying to figure out what the hell was the answer, okay? Um, on the other hand, people talk about the great ahas and inspirations from hallucinogens and whatever that just get you, oh my God, you know, whether it's from, even the people who say, you know, go out and run 10 miles and see what you come up with, okay? Same thing, you're getting that same kind of a, a spin in your head that lets you do that. By the way, coffee and, and sugar pretty much does it, which is why coffee and donuts are standard creativity there. The health food people don't really get that good at eating. So coffee and donuts <laughs> really get the, get the brain cooked. Okay. So the point is, there's a big difference. So on the one hand, we have kind of getting an aha or inspiration. And the other hand is doing a hard, creative, detailed work. And I must confess, my addiction is to the getting an aha or inspiration. And I get real bored with the detail work. On the other hand, I used to be a systems guy, and I loved writing software. Leave me alone, let me write, I'll spend eight straight hours writing software, working on the details, getting stuff done, getting that hard, focused, creative work. Okay? Different work. So the example I use with my students is, you wake up with the vision of a dolphin dancing with a unicorn. And then you spend a lot of time beating on a rock until it matches your vision. They're both creative work. Sitting there as a painter, dabbling in painting, if you're Jackson Pollock, dribbling more paint constantly, getting the idea of paint dribbling is an aha. Sitting there on a, on a whole framework going across your painting, dribbling paint, is intense creative work, but it's not the same creative work as, I got a great idea, I'm just going to dribble crap all over the place. Different kind of creative. And we're getting the idea of a computer on your wrist, I get crazy. Okay? Or working out all the details of an Apple Watch. Okay? It's different work. Now, on the other hand, you're never going to beat on the rock for that vision unless you have the vision. You need both pieces. But we have to recognize in ourselves which parts do we like. And I recognize the fact that I am addicted to ahas. Not that a hard trade work. Okay? So I get a great aha, I write a two page article on it, and then I'm done. I've got like a book, two or three books worth of stuff, all of which were write two pages, I'm done, I figured it out, I'm finished. I also realized that the reason why functional analysis makes me happy, I finally realized it goes back to algebra. I loved algebra. My favorite thing in algebra is going through and making terms not matter. When you could like say, well, the B's don't freaking matter because I got them out of here and I multiplied this and suddenly the C's disappeared and I'm down to like only two variables and I got this. I'm cool. What do we do with the aha? Uh -huh? We walk in. We walk into a company building a brand new factory and they're going like, so what's your function? We'll build the factory. You know, why? Well, to make stuff. Well, you're already making stuff. Why are you building the factory? Oh. Well, oh, you're going to make more stuff. Oh, okay. So you're not building a factory to build a factory and make stuff because you're already making stuff. Let's forget about that. Let's evaluate more stuff. And what's crazy is one of the recommendations was to delay the new plant till the better environmental technology came in and make up the sales in the meantime by ditching the crappy products that weren't making any money and by doing some marketing to switch the customer's choice of the material from a seasonal thing to the whole season. Thereby, they now have adequate capacity and delay the factory three or four years. But by that time, R&D was going to have a lot of this tough environmental problems solved. Okay? But if I walked in there just saying, hey, how do we build a factory? You never really got it. So to me, that's part of that process. So that function analysis is so, so easy. Yeah. Anyway, but there's a third step. Um, and some of you are familiar with the change model, like Kurt Lewin's change model, the unfreeze, shift, and refreeze. 
that any time people make a change, you don't just change. They have to somehow let go of the old, change to the new, grab onto the and it's in a way, even if you are implementing a known, proven process, this is a creative behavior. Okay? If I'm trying to align all the people in a company to a vision that I bought from McKinsey, it's still creative work. Okay? And so, but one of the things I really like about this is something about the process of changing that people have to be changed. Including your spouse, if you've got your stomach up, start getting up at five o'clock every morning, go running. Your your spouse, the dog, whoever has to get along with this deal. You know, you have to figure out. You got to make these changes in the environment. And there's a whole thing on socio-technical systems, which is another whole hour of conversation. But there's a great book. I don't know if you've seen the book, Slow Pace of Fast Change. Vasco Chakraborty. He basically wrote a book that said, why is it that technically we have been able to have things like everything ever invented, accessible 24-7 anywhere on the planet. We've had the technology for years. We don't have it yet. It's because, he goes back to game theory and points out all of these systems are balanced systems of multiple players, all of whom have different issues. And to change from state A to state B, if one guy changes and nobody else changes, they just waste a whole lot of money. So you've got to get everybody aligned and moving. And a lot of them have to make changes in terms of their business model, their relationships. It's a huge issue. Okay. That was Rob Wolcott's point in his um, Growth from Within, Northwestern. And okay. Said, you know, you, you, entrepreneurship inside is causing all the other functions to resist. You know, so it's kind of like a, an infection. As I can argue that the definition, the default definition of every job on the planet is to resist change. That's your job. Okay, you're an engineer. If you don't do anything else, resist any change is going to screw up the product. Okay. If you're a facilitator, your number one thing is don't let anything that'll happen will screw up the meeting. Resist any changes, they'll screw things up. That's kind of a, a default definition of how to do things. The nice thing about Chad Morty is he points out that you have to get these stakeholders and players to move and it takes time and if you don't address it directly, it can take forever. Naps are proof. We have the technology to share music all over the planet for free. There were some other players that needed to be dealt with. In the short term, the people who own the music were about to In the longer term, all the artists, because if Napster had continued, no artists would make any money. And everybody's playing for their uncles. I mean, it's just basically that's all you're doing. You're playing for your own playing your folk festival, not get paid any money. Okay? That's it. And so you have to get all these pieces together. And oftentimes, you have to figure out which part you're in love with. You, by the way, you make a lot more money making this one. You know, get one good idea, get somebody to work out the details, and then do this. That's where the people get to be at the top 1% of the 1%, okay, doing this kind of thing. But it's still creative. It's creative work. It's constantly changing people's minds, changing their interaction with each other. So I'm talking about inspiration, the aha, articulation, doing that creative work. It's like when you're working a lot of details out, you're, you have to get an idea, you still have to work all those bits and pieces out, you're into that phase. But implementation is when you're going out and you're getting this guy to make your parts for you, maybe you get to be in the maker thing, or you get a company to buy your stuff, you sell your company. Now you're into a different model of target. Now, there's a difference in targeting. I teach business strategy a lot. The classic differentiation that Michael Porter came up with back when he started doing research was that some companies get to be leaders by being the low cost leader, the Walmart. Okay, this is where you go to get. Okay? And some companies get to go in where you add features, benefits, and so forth. Apple has never been the low cost leader. Their job is differentiation, new and different, and so forth. You know, Starbucks is not about being the cheapest coffee you can make. It's not that you don't have to control costs, it's just that that's not your shtick. And Michael Curtin had this model, and Michael's argument was basically that, and I'm going to use the Curtin Adapter Innovator Scale as actually a test you take and see where you fall, because the idea that Curtin had was people of equal creativity you know, horsepower, 
Some are working down at the adapter end of making things better and better and better and better and better. And, better. and other people are blowing up the entire system. And they, like, I have a tendency to be an adapter. I mean, to be an innovator. I tend to blow things up. Okay? When I was a systems designer, somebody would hand me a systems design, I had to do it over again. Because I just couldn't just implement it. I just couldn't move into that phase. I had to blow it up, but all the way back to basics and come back down to redo it and so forth. Because that's my, my addiction. And part of my point of facilitators is recognize your own addiction. Did you blow it all up, or just most of it, or did you do like Picasso, take it apart, and you put it back together? I rethought. In other words, I did accept somebody else's aha. Sometimes you get an aha, like, oh, wow, that's awesome. Here, boom, 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 boom. I'm cool with that. I do believe in co-creating ideas and so forth, but I really know that my addiction is if somebody gives me a plan, the first thing I do is question, why is it a function? What the hell are you doing? Why are you doing this? What's your, what's your goal? The fun I have in teaching MBAs, I teach the last course for MBAs, their final graduation course. I explained to them that all that really cool math <laughs> is based on if you accurately measure the inputs and you accurately forecast the future, there are calculations that will tell you what to do. <laughs> that only happens when you look backwards as a professor doing research. <laughs> Telling stories looking backwards is not the same as telling stories looking forwards, okay? So what happens is, I keep showing to my students that first of all, don't get me wrong, the math is important. Math in MBAs keeps you from doing stupid stuff, like running out of cash flow, okay? Over-investing in this, not <laughs> losing money and not realizing it. This kind of stuff, the MBA is fantastic. But it keeps you from falling off a cliff, but it's never going to take it to the top of the mountain. So I keep pushing the creativity in the context of checking against your boundaries and barriers. And so I keep showing them that there's things that you know have to be transformed into question, kind of new ideas, and so forth. And so I've got a course this summer I mentioned to Paul where the, uh, the government of China, we've been working with the government of China for a number of years, running an MBA program, an accelerated MBA program for Asian students. And um, it's another one, it's one of the biggest good cost reduction thing because China came to us and says, uh, how come an MBA takes two years? And I'm like, your students have a summer off. Why do you have a summer off? That's stupid. And how much studying do you do in a week? It's like, what's a weekend? Okay. <laughs> and what's a holiday? <laughs> By the time we finish, you could cover all of the course hours that is covered by Northwestern or Chicago in four semesters in, you know, two years. You can cover all that same amount of class time in one calendar year with people who have been trained to study like crazy, who aren't busy drinking, aren't busy running around, and so forth. Um, so therefore, we got this whole program. And we just were approached by the Ministry of Health uh, to train members of the health professions in China give them MBAs so they can go back and be leaders in innovating the whole health system there. And so we have the first class going through and I taught them uh, back uh, in the fall and I sold them on a course, I've been teaching a course on innovation, uh, and I sold them on the course to add to their curriculum for the summer. And I also did the other thing I like doing, which is whenever I can, because we keep our Chinese Asian students separate from our usual evening students with the right schedule that can combine them in the same class. So I've got a class now that's got 16, haven't finished registration, we've got 16 Chinese doctors, managers, something like 30 years, you know, doctors for 20 years kind of people, uh, senior managers, junior managers, and then combined with our MBA students and other graduate students from all the campus. I mean, they identified all the departments. <coughs> And so it's going to be all about the process of innovation. You can that way. So that's good. So that, but again, my focus, I, I have to be careful that when I'm teaching, it's like you still have to do the hard work. Because I get bored and jump on to the next thing. Okay. Um, so Michael Porter's got this class leadership and differentiation. Okay? And to me, they're identical. Okay? These two definitely are cost leadership and differentiation. Those are, those are different. Identical in focus and style. 
So an adapter is busy trying to reduce cost, making it work smoother, better, faster, okay? So they give you your cost leadership. Over here, the innovator is saying it's not enough to take the Apple II and make it faster, cheaper. You gotta go out there. We gotta get into the music business. We gotta get into the phone business, you know, whatever. Uh, those kind of things. So basically, there's a spectrum is the innovators and disruptors don't just change the box, they find a better box for the goal. I've been a long believer, as Paul's going to be talking about, is I don't believe in out-of-box thinking, I believe better box thinking. And it goes back to function. Okay? If you say don't raise the bridge lower the water, it's a better box to say, how can I make the gap bigger? Or how can I get the boats passed? And when I change to that box, lowering the water is one of many obvious ideas. By the way, my favorite, and I've got a slide that's entering with me, is there's actually a place, at least one in Greece, where they actually sink the bridge under the water and let the boats go go high. Okay, just love it. To me, that's like a perfect solution. Okay. How do you do that? Okay, it's like, okay. And it's probably a lot cheaper to flood and inflate a, a, a bridge going up and down than it is to lift it up and down the other side. You know, Microsoft is really cool. Anyway, adapters can be highly creative, but within the established parameters. They find truer boxes to describe reality. So when they're changing their vision, they're getting closer to the truth, not blowing up the truth. Like, we don't really need this, we don't really need that. How can we take these five parts and get another one? There's some great work that was done in value engineering where they would take like components that had like 45 moving parts and get them down to three. Okay. My Charlie Wood House was great at that stuff. Okay. Um, they find truer boxes to describe reality and create within those. This is more like mystery novel people, puzzle solvers. It's very creative. But it's not the same creativity as inventing a whole new thing. I'm not saying you don't use some of the same techniques, but if you're busy down here trying to improve the buggy whip, and you have a high speed, six sigma, uh, high process, low cost, robotic production line for buggy whips, you probably should have been working on other ways to use leather on cars. I mean, that's probably where you should have been. And part of strategy is aiming people where the innovation is needed. Okay? Because some innovations are worthless. Okay? Uh, going back to the implementation thing, I was doing some, I was chatting with a guy who was in the Department of Defense and he was doing the value engineering program where you actually get to share the savings for the product. And he says, you know, I got guys that come in here and they got these really cool ideas to cut product parts in half, cost in half. He says, but the parts are on a minute man missile. Any change in the design requires three test firings of a minute man missile, which is like 20 grand, 20 million bucks. You've got to save me a whole lot of money to change that design in any way whatsoever. You know, so sometimes the ideas aren't worth it. So this is kind of the model. It's like easier to see, it's just a print on the same thing. But as you go across, here's my left and right is the innovator versus adapter. Um, and more the cost, you know, the disruptive leader on the left, the cost leader on the right. And so I'm saying that when you're trying to do innovative creativity, you're looking for insights for doing better alternatives, you're really pushing for um, inventors, entrepreneurs, whole new businesses, whole new ideas, stuff like that. On the adapter, you're still trying to get insights. Like with a function analysis, you can get insights we'll let you take 80% of the cost out of something. Okay? But those are techniques that are not trying to change the product, they're trying to work within the constraints. Okay? Now the craftsmanship is going through the details. Okay, one of the things that Jen and I work together is she loves getting into details and I get bored. Uh, so we get her all the, you know, she goes through all the cost sheets and goes like, wait a minute, why are they spending so much on springs or whatever, you know, it's that kind of stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I, I just put the team to group make them up. Because uh, I'm waiting for them to come up with cool ideas. And so that's what the craftsmanship is, taking the time, working out the details, okay? So somebody gets an idea in a, cre in a creative meeting, in a product meeting, goes, oh, let's add this. Just how would that work? Okay, let's walk through the steps, and can we come up with two or three designs? Or if we have a design for this cool thing, whatever. So one kind of brainstorming says, well, it would be really cool if this had 
uh, a microphone in it and maybe had a recorder in it, or what about a flash memory, uh, what about a little screen and I can see what's, you know, whatever, I can play games like that. We're getting out the details of some of the process. And then also working on how to fit them into the system is another way, okay? And sometimes the best opportunities are finding ways to better fit the rest of the system. We were doing work with uh, Shure Microphone and we were training their engineers and business people about business strategy and teamwork creativity at the same time. And Shure has a very interesting, I don't mean, really work with Shure. Shure has a very interesting process which is they try to hire people who are amateur musicians and others who use microphones. So you have a whole building full of engineers and microphone users who want to make cooler and cooler and cooler products. And the engineers want to make more and more accurate products. So what's the most popular microphone today? Auto-tune. Hello, there's no accuracy whatsoever in auto-tune. It's like fuzz is suffer. And as a matter of fact, they found that when they really got going on what would drive sales the best, having software that would allow people in large venues to sync, rapidly synchronize 20 or 50 or 100 microphones into the same system. Hmm. That software locked people in to buy huge packages numbers of microphones. And so what the employees really wanted to do was make a really cool microphone. And the engineers wanted a really accurate microphone. Wasn't going to make any money in business. So this is why when you think strategically about what corner should I be working in, you know, part of it is coming down here and saying, you know, the bottom left would be, how can we make our partners happier? How can we make the other guys more successful? How do we make them rich? And the bottom right, which is what most people hate if you're in creativity, is really the culture of discipline, which is we have a plan, this is how we do things, how do we get everybody lined up doing the plan? How do we get everybody at Starbucks to treat the employees, treat the customers the same way? How do you get everybody to make coffee the same way? And Howard Schultz, a couple of years ago, shut down the entire company for a day because he felt they'd lost their culture and they had a whole day of training on Starbucks culture just to get everybody back on board. And so that's kind of that bottom right corner of getting people locked into that thing. So basically, you know, my question is, if you look at this model, do you notice yourself tending to work in one of those quadrants and not in one of those quintets or whatever we're going to call them, sections? Or, or does this fit your work? Do you find yourself tending to be more in one place than another? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to you in terms of how you, you know, maybe one, one or two that you tend to be in? Because, well, you know. It depends, Chris, I think, in the situation, though, right? That you Mm -hmm. I can come in and be an entrepreneur in one situation, but if, if the project or the situation requires some realism, I can't be a creative inventor because... Well, then you have to move in your techniques more over to the adapter side. Right. Okay. So, like, when we're doing value engineering, one of the reasons we, we again, had a really good reputation in VE business is we really would do a lot of things with, like, find new and different ways to do things. So, for example... Uh, one of our teams came up with a way to save the city of New York like $100 million in construction costs uh, with a really creative idea of how to, a new way to do uh, heating and heating uh, design in the company. On the other hand, going into a company where it's like, okay, we, we, we took the whole uh, Toyota course and they said you're supposed to do value engineering at step 14. So would you come and tell us how to do it? It's like, okay, here's like this component. You know, how could you take the stuff out of a sprocket? You know, we're down to that detailed level, work it out, walk your way through it. When we did construction projects, the Corps of Engineers was noted. For if the Corps of Engineers gave you a project, it was already defined down to the point you couldn't change anything. <laughs> then they said, do something. Because they're making us do this, and we'll bet you, you can't find it. I mean, we're in Germany, and they've got these buildings laid out. Oh, yeah, we're using the standard design for the modules. Uh -huh. And the buildings are there because... If you move at a foot, uh, you have to get federal permission to cut down a tree in Germany. Uh, still had good results. But that ability to work in a constraint area is different. And so I have to watch myself where I will try to reinvent the whole product when what they really need is get something that we can get out of here to make this go and fit in that moment. Okay, so that's kind of my thing because that was my second question is, you know, is that what your best skills are? <coughs> And maybe you're actually better at something than you normally do, okay? But the real question is, is it what your clients are looking for? 
Okay, okay. It's really hard, and this is true for any strategic planning or whatever. It's like I talk to senior executives on strategy. If you're an awesome engineer, and you're a senior guy in a company, then what's going to move that company ahead is not engineering. You're like, oh, man, why are these marketing people getting involved? I want to work on engineering. And they're really frustrated because you want an engineering solution to the better company instead of the marketing solution. That's like, yeah. that's like a group I had one time. They said, we're not very creative. We need to get creative, but don't make us too creative. We don't want to get out of the box. We need to push the envelope because if we get too creative, we won't be able to implement it. Yes. And I know my bias was, let's get wild and crazy and figure out how to implement it within the constraints. But that would have driven them absolutely nuts. And if I'd done it, I would have heard them. Absolutely. And I, you know, I do bring up things which say, I love to challenge the, um, I love to challenge the constraints. Are they really constraints? And again, the function really helps. Um, one of the interesting things in my life is that one of my competitors is my mother. Okay, so actually both my parents. My father was started with the value engineering part of the GE. He and my mother both worked. Um, what was crazy after a while was she would work solo as a female entrepreneur, and he would work solo as an American Indian entrepreneur, which was really funny because he was as Irish as that is big. But his grandmother, since he had a small amount of Indian blood, she signed him up for his tribe back before they changed the rules on blood. So he was legally an Indian, even though he was, as I said, Irish and Spanish. And he never did it until they found out there were a bunch of people doing the value engineering work within the Bureau of Indian Affairs who had no qualifications whatsoever. He said, well, in that case, this is stupid. Those guys don't know what they're doing. So he went in, finally took his Indian number, and got the projects. I felt it was fair because when my father would go to the Indian movies, he knew all the songs. You know, he goes to see Dance of the Bulls, he knew the songs, he knew all this stuff, so I felt that was fair. But I still remember my mother was doing a project in uh, Taipei, and Ta uh, they had a, they built a light rail system over there, and a lot of value engineering people did. And they were working on this one uh, train station for the light rail, and uh, it was in a non optimum location for the operation of the trains. And it's like, well, why isn't it over there? Well, because that's where the tea plantations are, and the tea people in Taiwan have huge political power. And they're not about to let you tear down their tea to put out the train station. She says, well, why don't you ask them? Well, no, you know, they won't do it. Said, Oops. So she proposed that they build a multi-use building that in addition to be a train station, it was like a wine tasting place for tea a big sales operation for tea, promoting tea and everything like this. And all the engineers were griping and moaning, and even her clients were by her, but she forced them to put it in the, in the, in the report. And um, she got somebody called her about a year later, she had that stupid idea about that. They did it, that's where the train station is. We took, we, when we were in Taiwan, we tried to get off the train station there and take a picture, but it was a little too iffy. So I didn't do it, but like, this station is here's my mother's royal. Okay, but this is kind of a question, okay? Um, is this what your clients are looking for? Um, and uh, you know, do any approaches seem to fit a specific type? And I'll give out copies of the handouts, and there's some links there for checking out things out. But what do you think? Does this make sense? Yeah. How, how would you put the emotional context on this? Uh, and, and what would you say there's an emotional context where there's risk aversion? People are afraid to do things sometimes, not some of the box. Well, first of all, I think that everybody should be risk averse. I also have a real hot button about the concept of resistance to change. It's not true. There is no such thing. And I can prove it to you. I want you to picture in your mind the person that is most resistant to change that you've ever met in your life. Okay. okay. Now, I want you to imagine that someone has come into that person and explained to them that they're going to double their income this year with no negative side effects. Is that a major change? Yes. I don't know what a negative side effect is. I I'm just saying there, you just said there's not. So the question is, there's no resistance to change. People resist bad change. People resist change they don't understand. I tell you, my first rule for people in cost reduction programs, and especially if you're an engineer by background, 
If you don't have time to check it, don't change it. Don't get excited. I refuse to let creative groups make final decisions on anything. I simply say we're feeding them into the decision-making structure of the company. I don't believe in implementation teams running crazy because they do stupid stuff. They fall in love with their ideas. We were in a project with a, with a marketing company and um, I was picking on the fact that it's, it's hard to have uh, ideas if you don't really understand a group. And I looked around the room, everybody was like 30 something. And I'm saying like, you know, you guys really want a lot of products for seniors and there's nobody in the room who has any idea what you're talking about, okay? Because nobody has the experience. I said, you know, it's sort of like, um, you know, a bunch of golfers get together on a weekend and, you know, they offer some executives off their executive retreat golfing and they get some idea about golfing and they totally love it because they're into golfing and because that's what they understand. And everybody started to laugh. I'm going, like, that's not that funny. He said, no. We had four executives who went off on a golfing weekend of executive retreat, got this awesome idea for a system where people could sign up memberships and club and affinity club for golfing. And it turned out they were basically the only customers on the planet. <laughs> okay. But once we got this thing up and launched and we had all these commitments, it cost us a million dollars to get out of the business. But nobody could stop them because it was four executives who thought it was a freaking awesome idea. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't back them down. So that's where this question is. That's why I really like like I remember, uh, Joy Manufacturing had a process that was great. Did really good value engineering. But it was like all pro all changes are audited by the engineers. All costs are audited by the finance department. Mm -hmm. Okay. So and what's one of the advantages we've had is a lot of our competition are professional engineers, like value engineering, and we're able to put on every page of our report. These are suggestions for you to evaluate fully. Because some of, our some of our competitors got caught that people assumed that because they were PE that this was a professional engineering recommendation when in fact in a creative meeting you haven't checked it that well. Mm -hmm. They assume it's not going to work. And so that's kind of this whole push on that. <coughs> so uh, in my take in this, it's like, you know, we, you have to look at these other issues. Sometimes you, Again, I keep teaching strategy, and um, I find it's easier to teach creativity to strategy people than strategy to creativity people. The same thing for engineering. It's a lot easier to teach creativity to engineers than to teach engineering to, to, to creative people, um, which is why I'm you know, basically working a lot with MBAs and engineers when I'm doing the education stuff. Um, but those are just kind of things I'm looking at, because I think strategically it's so easy to get enthused about doing your favorite thing, and then you have a bunch of blue bunnies for something when they need it. A new railroad that's like, <laughs> you know. And so to me, this model, this way of thinking, of being careful about where they can go strategically and even understanding what is their strategy can let you better target the kind of things you're doing. And this is also true for facilitation. If you're in a mode of we are learning, you will find that there are no problems, there is no failure. And as I said over and over again, so if your goal is, I came out to learn, did you learn something? If your company has that as an emotional model, if. Yeah, yeah, it's a big yes. if. But it's also the same thing for, I have been firmly convinced that all the facilitation tools are learning tools, not creativity tools. The least important thing is the ideas that get written down. The most important thing is what happens to people in the meeting. My research showed that people who did design, uh, did decision matrices, got better ideas. And when I started analyzing, it turned out, when I analyzed people for the really wild ideas and structured problem solving, the coolest ideas came up during the documentation phase. You get devils in the details and so is the innovation. That's where you suddenly pop, because what happens is, instead of, See, the standard creativity model is a manufacturing model. Get your raw materials, manufacture, pack, inspect, package it. Okay? That's the model. You don't expect inspection to turn your product into a better product. But 
I am convinced every single thing we call facilitation is about creating people who are smarter and smarter and smarter and smarter till the solution is obvious. And what you're really doing is creating groups who are capable of a relevant aha. I can't really get a relevant aha about golf. The little bit I know from being a caddy means doesn't mean I'm going to have a relevant aha about golf. Okay? But if I create a good team, they can have a relevant aha. Some of the, all of the worst horror stories you've heard about creativity or you've experienced have generally because you had a team who was excited, energetic, and did not, their ahas were not relevant to the real problem. They weren't connected enough to that. All right? Okay, so, and my best example of that is you're on an airplane, you meet somebody, you start talking about you, and you're getting along kind of friendly, you tell them some problem you've got. They got this really cool idea. Well, I think you should quit your job and move to California. It's like, you obviously don't understand my situation, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, wait, and, but, it, it, but within the model I know of you, this is the perfect answer. And the reason creativity often has a bad rap is because people take these first ideas, fall in love with them, and then try to throw them down people's throat, or even worse, have the power to make them so. And when it actually works, what people like Steve Jobs, we write books about them. And when they bankrupt their companies, well, I see that, we don't write as many books about it, okay? Uh, so it's one of the things as facilitators we have to be careful about is are we actually helping them with people who have relevant aha to the kind of problem we're looking at? And then the techniques are like, well, how do we break them loose? So how do you get people to have less of a risk aversion You can start seeing as learning instead of seeing it as that? And that's what a facilitator does. Well,